Uh, Dr. John Porter is the is the um, director of the Osher Center for Integrative Health at the University of Vermont. Um, I met him in Seattle last fall, and turns out integrative medicine tends to attract really sort of beautiful human beings, kind and warm, but also folks that are doing really incredible work. Um, he is uh, has done some work in Vermont around chronic pain in a way that is a truly integrative approach. And uh, I'm so thrilled that he agreed to share that work with us and just sort of share his presence as well. So um, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Porter and um, welcome, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Greta. And um, was delightful to be in Seattle and meet you last year at the annual meeting. and. Um, and just get to know each other a little bit and delighted to be here and delighted um, to see everything that's going on at Wisconsin. So thank you, John Porter. And I am he, him, and, and a couple of acknowledgements here. I often find, um, maybe next slide if you would, Sarah, thanks. Um, land acknowledgements um, uh, often have a quality of box checking to me. And so there is an official land acknowledgement for the University of Vermont. But but as I think about this, I, I just want to acknowledge that the land that I'm sitting on now uh, here in the Champlain Valley in Vermont um, has been occupied by the Abnaki peoples um, for probably around 12,000 years, those folks and their ancestors. So, so that was a time when um, the last of the woolly mammoths were in the Lake Champlain Basin. There were polar bears here. They hunted and they um, and they gathered. And then about 3,000 years ago, they began to cultivate the land um, and grow crops. Um, and then about 400 years ago, um, the first European settlers arrived in Vermont in the southeastern part of Vermont. But just to acknowledge that long, long history of um, of living on the land and being part of this land and the very short history that that we have here um, and how difficult it has been for the Abnaki people um, and for indigenous people all over the all over the globe. Um, and then for me, just to acknowledge, you know, that I am a, a white heterosexual male. I am privileged, honestly, in about every uh, point of the wheel uh, in terms of privilege. Um, and so I want to let you know that I come to this work with a with an intention to be very humble um, and with a wish to um, have you let me know about blind spots that may uh, come up during our conversation and and I'm just committed to to working to understand more fully um, the entire human experience. So thank you for having me. Um, next slide, Sarah would be great. So today we're going to run through some things. Again, I, I come to this uh, work and, and we at Vermont come to this with humility. We kind of um, needed to develop this program and I'll go into this in a little bit because of problems that we were having with the traditional approach to uh, working with folks with chronic pain. Um, so I want to just touch base briefly about, about the, the kind of prevalence of chronic pain I want to talk about our paradigm versus the traditional paradigm used in care. Um, what is it that folks, participants, as we refer to them rather than patients, what do they experience as they go through the program? How did we kind of create our financial model? Um, and what was it like to get going? And I'll share some outcomes that we've had um, with the folks who have been through the program to date, and then talk about where we seem to be headed. Um, next slide, Sarah. So, you know, the challenge of chronic pain um, is really remarkably large, right? It's highly prevalent so that about 7% of the U.S. population has what can be classified as high impact chronic pain. And that means that over the last three months, one or more major arenas of function have been affected on most days. Um, and so if we think of numbers, um, I think Wisconsin has about almost 6 million folks in the state. Um, that's about 400,000 people who are living day to day with chronic pain. 
and in Dade County, um, in Dane County, it's about 40,000 folks. So this is something we see all the time in our primary care uh, experiences um, and a challenge, um, not just for the folks who are presenting with chronic pain, but given the, the narrow nature of our toolbox, um, a challenge for clinicians when we see them in the primary care setting as well. That $635 billion um, number is from 2011. Uh, it's one of the most costly um, medical conditions uh, to, to the U.S. economy. And again, just to acknowledge that um, the burden of care for folks with chronic pain traditionally falls on the primary care settings, right? That this is something that, that um, we all have encountered probably every day in our practice. Um, next, Sarah, please. So this program didn't arise for no reason. It, it really arose out of the way that we had been approaching care as an allopathic um, workforce over decades, right? So when I came here, I inherited a group of about 80 folks who we refer to as our legacy patients. And these folks had been maintained um, and treated in accord with what were considered of standards of care you know, from the 90s really through to the, to the mid-teens. There are about 80 of them in this practice when I came over. Um, the average MMEs was around 800. Um, I had several folks up around 2,000 MMEs, many on benzodiazepines. Um, and the first afternoon that I actually started writing prescriptions for, um, for these folks in my first half day, uh, you know, I was just almost nauseated by how, how much I had written um, and I, and I went home to my wife that evening and said, you know, just report me to the board of medical practice now and let's get this over with because it was really so striking and really so kind of sad, but just to acknowledge our accountability, um, in terms of how we got here as a field, as an allopathic field, right. And it had to do with very sketchy initial information, a marketing campaign that was, um, vigorous and, um, and really effective, and then buy-in from regulatory bodies and official medical groups about the importance of treating pain, um, using, um, using oxycodone, basically. And then with a, with a condition that's very prevalent, how do, you, how do you work with that? Well, you fit it into a 15-minute visit or a 30-minute visit, and, and the pill helps you do that, right? And as we know, that led to really terrible, terrible catastrophic outcomes for people um, with overdose deaths related to opiates, you know, in the mid-teens over the, over the entire 2010 to 2020 uh, decade. And so, so we have to hold that accountability um, as we think about, you know, how to approach the challenge of chronic pain in a different way. Um, next, Sarah, please. So part of the dynamic in that story is that um, we treated chronic pain as a symptom, right? Um, as opposed to an experience, right? So if you treat chronic pain as acute pain that just goes on for a while, that's, that's how you end up using medicines and interventions. Um, but if we think about the experience of folks who have chronic pain, um, you know, think about the experience of waking up with pain every day, maybe not having slept well because of pain, um, and and having this relationship with your body that is that is at times antagonistic and difficult. Right? We know that the prevalence of mental health challenges, depression, anxiety are are high in the group of folks that have chronic pain. Um, the prevalence of past trauma is very high. And as people have worked with their pain, they have happened, most often had a transformation in their sense of self, right? So they have a different role in their family. Um, vocationally, they may not be able to do what they had been doing or wanted to do. Um, their financial status is often threatened by that. And so dealing with this whole um, new self that, that can be a very isolating experience. And then they're often othered, right? When they walk into the medical office, and Dr. Porter sees them for 15 or 30 minutes and that appointment often runs over and they leave with a you know, prescription for a new medicine or a change in dose. 
but it's not getting at the at the root experience that folks are having. So part of the challenge is how do we how do we kind of take that on in our work with folks? Um, next, please, Sarah. So this is um, from our mission statement in the program, um, and and we read it to people at the beginning of the program in the orientation. But this idea that you are not in any way separate from from this life that you are whole in terms of what you bring to the experience that working with chronic pain, living with chronic pain is very difficult, but it does hold everything that is human in it. Um, the opportunity to learn, to experience joy, to, to be whole, right? So, so that's the beginning of our kind of paradigm shift for folks. Next, please, Sarah. So next slide, just a couple of our intentions in working with folks. Um, Again, people with chronic pain often don't feel seen in their experience at all. So, so we work hard to make sure that, that that happens for them. And that begins with the intake visit, which is either 60 or 90 minutes, working hard to get as much of the story as we can from them. Um, and, and that begins a whole process for the program that I'll, that I'll talk about a little bit as we go through the, the nuts and bolts of the program. Um, the environment is really unconditionally supportive. So this is a 16 week long program. Um, it is pretty intensive. Um, issues come up for folks, but through their time here, they know that both within the group cohort that they're part of and, the, and on the part of staff and clinicians working here, um, they will be supported in the experience. And next slide, please, Sarah. Um, so this is a shift for folks, right? That that going from this model where you go into a physician's or a clinician's office, you get a new medicine, you get a referral to this question of here I am, how am I gonna take on it, this on? What skills do I need? What therapies can I access that will be helpful to me? That's a really heavy lift for people, right? But it is the ask in the program um, that you know the goal for, for you from our standpoint is to have you leave the program feeling confident that that you can work with this. Um, this is the beginning of a process for people. And next, please, Sarah. The other really important thing to us is um, how do you create a healthy work environment? And not just lip service in this regard, but really what does it look like to create a work environment in the midst of a lot of suffering where clinicians therapists, staff can actually flourish, can be their authentic selves, can bring the skills that they have to offer. Um, and so we pay attention to this. And a lot of the way that we found um, to do this is through the teamwork and the, and the team meetings and, um, and the way we kind of approach the, the real challenge of suffering. Part of my concern, I, you know, the practice is trauma informed, um, certainly. Um, but I think part of my concern, just as we move forward, is how are we making sure that we are not, um, as a work community, replicating the trauma that we are working with in folks? And I think um, we have sessions coming up to work on that. But, but again, really being intentional about how to help folks um, have a healthy workplace and not just a, a job that you go to every day. Um, next, please, Sarah. So this is... Um, kind of an outline of what happens with folks when they when they come here. Um, so they stay in the same cohort through their entire 16 week um, program. Eight to 12 folks is, is what a typical cohort is. I think eight to 10 um, is much better in terms of community building as opposed to 12. Um, they come here every week and they have um, sessions which are either 90 or 120 minutes long excuse me, the first half of the program uh, is based on acceptance and commitment therapy, which I'll talk about briefly and is run by either the psychologist or the clinical social worker. The second half is structures of the medical group visit and is in a co-facilitated model. And then around that and interspersed in these weekly group sessions uh, are access to health coaches, um, neuroscience education about pain, um, kitchen conversations with the nutritionist, monthly cooking classes, and a med-ed session on cannabis. 
So part of the goal here is not to have folks going through the program without their support system knowing what's happening. So the Care Alliance group um, is invited, whoever that primary support person might be, if there's one identified, is invited to orientation. And then three times of that 16 weeks invited to um, come for support uh, to learn what's happening in the program so they have a sense of what their, what their uh, relative or friend is uh, engaged in. And then after the program, there are monthly alumni gatherings for, um, for participants. And I'll talk a little bit more about that challenge in a minute. Next, please, Sarah. So this first half, these weekly sessions um, in the first half of the program, again, based on acceptance commitment therapy. Um, this is Stephen Haynes, Hayes out of the University of Nevada who developed this probably 30 years ago. Um, and it does harken back a little bit to the mission statement um, that I kind of um, showed you at the beginning, but this idea that um, they, that life is difficult, um, that working with chronic pain is a particular kind of real difficulty, um, but that there are ways to get through it um, through the use of mindfulness, of kind of accepting what this life is holding at this moment for you, um, and, and using your values to kind of drive how to move forward in life. So this is the first half of the program. Um, and it is, um, it is quite highly structured. Um, there are sessions and worksheets each week that folks do and they, and they work through together. Um, but, but important skill development for what we do in the second half of the program, I think. Um, next, please, Sarah. The medical group visit then is co-facilitated and, and I have done these groups for years and now um, the other clinicians and physicians are just getting going um, co-facilitating with Laurel Audi, who is our um, nurse and program coordinator who has a background in palliative care. But the four uh, cornerstones that we use in this part of, of the um, work are mindfulness, self-compassion, it's often a real challenge for people with chronic pain, um, spirituality, which again, don't often hear about in medical settings, but in our framing of it, it's not about religion, but it's about here we are in this mortal life, right? Um, how, how do you want to be in this place? Um, how do you want to move forward? And just giving people the option, the opening to kind of connect to larger entities, larger ways of, of experiencing meaning, and then community and connection. Um, which really, I think, might be the actual secret sauce of the program, um, because over those 16 weeks, groups often develop a very um, close association with one another, um, and it's an amazing source of, of strength for people uh, as they go through the program and beyond. Next, please, Sarah. So then around these weekly group sessions, folks have access to all of these therapies, um, and I won't read them, but um, there's about 12 of them, I think. Um, so how, first of all, how did we pick the therapies? Well, we tried generally when we were starting the program to choose therapies that had at least some basis in the literature um, for being efficacious um, in working with folks with chronic pain, but also which were not traditionally covered by insurance. Right, so we, I'll talk about the bundle a little bit that we use the financial bundle, but we could use that bundle to pay for these therapies. So this is a wide range of therapies. And then the other question that you might be asking is how do people even know what to do, right? How do they know where to start with these therapies? So some people come in with a fixed idea of, of what they want to do and that's fine. Some people have not had any exposure to, to the therapies at all. And so, um, in the orientation session, when they come, they will receive from the people leading the orientation a list of what the group, the integrative group has kind of discussed might be helpful for them to think about. So what that means is before the group starts, we've met as an integrative team, looked at each person's story, the person who did the intake will give a brief kind of capsule summary, and then the acupuncturist might be, might say, I've had success with, with um, you know, pudendal neuritis or, you know, people will kind of give feedback about what they think might be helpful. 
And so that goes then to the person as they're starting the or orientation and engaging in the program. Doesn't mean they have to do that, but it's an important signal that they've been seeing, right? That the group has seen them, thought about them. These are some options. But again, each participant has the ability to decide what they want to do. And that's intentional in terms of, again, trying to, to give folks a sense of agency as they navigate the program. Um, the team here is, is, we, is referred to as a transdisciplinary one, which is, which is different than the other team structures that are often used um, in traditional or in integrative settings. Every week we have an integrative case review where we either talk about groups coming in, groups at the midpoint, or groups about to graduate. And as well, we talk about folks who, who may be having particular problems and challenges. So that's a group of about 12 or 14 folks sitting in for an hour, um, kind of going over the group and figuring out what might be helpful for them. So out of those conversations, which are really very rich, um, new ideas come. So, so sometimes people have particular anxiety, for example, about acupuncture, and they may be scheduled for a Reiki session before acupuncture. And the Reiki um, clinician and the acupuncturist will work together on that individual. But what happens with this transdisciplinary approach is two things. One, we, we get these new creative ideas, right, of, of maybe, maybe this will work in this situation. But this is also a, a chance for the team to kind of carry the, the challenge of an individual and a cohort together. Um, so we really value those discussions on Tuesday and, and um, in both in terms of the care direction that they provide and in terms of the bonding that happens between the team members. Next slide, please, Sarah. This is just a screenshot um, of, of the meetings. They're pretty um, light. There's, there's humor, um, but there's also serious kind of wonderings and curiosity about what may be going on with someone and, and how to help somebody move forward, either in the program or in a broader sense of things. Next, please, Sarah. So just to go back to how how we're able to do this. And, and for example, the case review, the integrative case review is something that's paid for in the bundle, right? That's 12 people for an hour. Um, that's expensive time. Um, so when I came um, to this program um, and was told by the administrator, um, who's now a real champion, um, you know, we just expect to hemorrhage on this program. You just do what you need to do because we've, we've obviously gotten to a tough place with a legacy group. So um, so came over, kind of got the bones together, the program was able to assemble with Kara Feldman Hunt's help, a, a network of integrative um, clinicians who were interested in working on it. And then it came time to say, now, how are we going to pay for these folks? And it turns out that if you, um, if you go through the human resource group to figure out how much to pay in acupuncture, and this would have been 2017, it came out to about $16 an hour, right? So, so that just wasn't going to work. Um, so I went back to the administrator and said, we, we have a problem. You know, how do we, how do we do this? And she, in a well-rehearsed <laughs> maneuver, pulled out my RVU sheet and said, do you see what your RVUs look like? You're, I don't know how you're going to pay for this. So, so then that led to the process of, of working with medical leadership um, here in the network. And this idea of a bundle came up. Right. So bundle everything together, throw it all in and work with a payer. And so who's the payer? And, and so this is where Vermont Blue Cross Blue Shield comes in. Um, and this was Josh Clavin, who's um, who was CMO of Vermont Blue Cross Blue Shield at that point. They had been looking at their uh, spend on musculoskeletal issues and pain and were concerned and wanted to try something different. Um, and so so. Blue Cross Blue Shield came into the game. We developed this bundle. Um, you know, at that point, the program was eight weeks long. And, and basically what we did is we tried to predict for each individual, how many times would they use each of those therapies? And we came up with a cost. Um, and that's what we presented Blue Cross Blue Shield and they accepted it. Um, but again, this requires, um, you know, 
a lot of conversation, developing relationships, um, and, a, and a really motivated um, pair, which Blue Cross Blue Shield has been great about. Josh is now with us. He's the associate medical director over here. So we we are grateful for his expertise and in, in, in his um, experience in the payer world. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. So the other thing we had to do is try to convince the medical center that um, at least we weren't doing any harm and we hopefully were doing some good. So we designed this suite of outcome measures. Um, these are pre and post measures, um, quality of life. I won't go through all of the all the measures, but you'll see some of the outcomes in the next slides. Um, on the left is the quality of life information. Um, and on the right is the, the outcome information. So just to say that this is, um, again, it's a whole separate piece of work um, to gather the quality of life information. We have long, for a long time, had um, intention to kind of get extended outcomes. So, so right now participants pay at the beginning or they fill out the forms at the beginning. It takes about a half hour for them to do that. It's all pencil and paper or, or paper and pen. So it's pretty labor intensive. They do the same thing when they exit the program. Um, and so this is part of our challenge now is, is figuring out how to incorporate this workflow in a way that works much better for the participants. At any rate, that's what we've gathered for the last four years. Um, and then with Blue Cross Blue Shield's claims analysis on the right, um, you know, for them, does it make sense as a payer to, to run a program like this? Next slide, please, Sarah. So we'll go to some outcomes now. Um, and these are drawn from all of the scales that you saw on the previous slide. But, but what we've seen overall, um, and this is the, the pay um, scale, is some decrease in pain intensity, um, a bigger increase in how much pain is interfering with life in terms of being able to do the things that are, that are important to uh, participants. Next slide, please, Sarah. The PROMISE 29 is kind of our foundational measure. And again, there's seven realms here, and I won't go through each one. But we've seen statistically significant drops in our small n um, over the first um, many cohorts that we've done over the, over the last four years. So these are all moving in the right direction. And again, to us, the important thing is um, are we producing some value in the individual's life? Are we making it so that um, pain does no longer become the, the primary reality of their day-to-day -day life? Um, next slide, please, Sarah. These are the brief resilience scales, self-compassion scales. Self-compassion highly correlated with um, success in, in working with chronic pain. So that along with mindfulness is infused throughout the curriculum and some, some nice positive and significant changes on those outcome measures. Next slide, please, Sarah. Um, CPAC-8 is, is, again, a validated scale. On the right, health confidence. This is, a, this is actually one of the measures that I like the best. It's out of Dartmouth, um, and we adapted it for use with chronic pain, but it basically is a rating system you draw a line about how confident you feel in working with your chronic pain at the beginning of the program and at the end of the program. And again, so our common experience in all of this is that as people go through the program, as they get connected to therapies that help, as they connect to a community in the program, as they find um, you know, an environment that is supportive um, to, to them having agency and efficacy, they tend to feel much better about, about how they can move forward uh, going up beyond the program. Next, please, Sarah. So then we go to kind of the financial outcomes and the costs. And, and so we see this is 12 months um, per member per, per month uh, measure. So this is 12 months post-program. So our quality of life surveys are pre and immediate post-program, and those are nice. We haven't gotten to the year and kind of year out evaluations yet, but these numbers give us some sense that there is a, a lasting um, effect, at least to the first year for folks. So we see decreased costs in medical services overall, 
prescription costs, um, costs for musculoskeletal spend, a, a little bit of an increase in interventional uh, um, procedure. And we think that's because people come and they need an interventional procedure. And so we refer them over to the, to the uh, group next door. Next, please, Sarah. Um, and again, just showing overall surgery and interventional costs down for the 12 months post program, pain RX down for the first for the first 12 months after the program. I just want to make a note here that the intention of the program is not to get people off opiates or even to reduce their opiates. That we think that during the 16 week period of time that we're with them, that's not time when we will see significant change. But it is a time when people do start to look at their medicines um, that we meet with almost each one of the participants medically at some point during that 16 weeks, go over what's happening in great detail with them as far as traditional medical treatments, talk about what they're up to with opiates. But we see that as a longer term corollary of the program and we need to demonstrate that that's the case. But, but not having people who are on opiates come in uh, with the sense that that's the goal is to get them off opiates because they've they've been through that pony show on the outside world and the intention here is focusing on how to how to kind of optimize wellness for self um, in this process. Um, and then this is again 12 months post program what happens with ED visits um, and so we're heading on to a you know a 70% decrease in terms of uh, emergency room visits um, and so for Blue Cross Blue Shield this almost pays for the program by itself, right? For our, for our perspective, this means that people generally are in a lot less duress and experiencing a lot less suffering um, in their lives. Because when, when you get to the place with chronic pain where you're thinking about going to the hospital, which is generally not a welcoming environment, you are, you're in some, some significant um, difficulty, right? And so so the fact that people are using skills um, that they've learned in the program to kind of work with the pain is, is, a, is what's heartening to us about this. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. So um, just stepping back for a minute in terms of how this, how this worked, it really was this wonderful collaboration between Vermont Blue Cross and Blue Shield um, and the medical center and the willingness of both parties to work together. So when we started, we had meetings every week to discuss what the program would look like, what we thought the cost would be like to design the bundle, but there has to be motivation on both sides. For Blue Cross Blue Shield, their, their dollar spend was way too high um, for pain and musculoskeletal um, complaints. For the network, um, it was this realization that we had kind of uh, not serve this legacy group well at all, that we had um, we had treated them in a one-dimensional fashion. Next slide, please, Sarah. So what happens now? Well, we've been doing this for four years, um, and during that entire four years, we have um, been after Medicaid to allow us to engage um, Medicaid subscribers in the program. So Blue Cross Blue Shield, obviously a private payer, um, and uh, and that's a certain population, right? But but offering this entire smorgasbord of folks to who have some degree of of you know financial wherewithal, somebody in the family is working, or they're working, the participant is working. Um, we felt um, not good about um, not offering the full smorgasbord to to everybody. I should note that during the past four years, there's been the PATH program, which is a bundle program. We've also had the COMPASS program for folks who have all other insurance, including Medicaid, Medicare, um, other private payers. That program is a 10-week program. It's a weekly meeting, um, the group meeting, and it's based on the acceptance commitment therapy. And, and I think effective in its own right, we don't have good data on it. We have outcome measures that we just haven't been able to analyze yet. Um, but a 10 week experience with very limited uh, access to anything that's not traditionally fee for service. So um, this past 
year, we've been in more intensive conversations with Medicaid, and they have just signed a contract with the Health Network as of about two weeks ago for a pilot program. So we're going to um, engage 100 Medicaid subscribers. That starts in October. Um, it will nearly double our volume, but again, we'll be looking closely um, at, at how folks are accessing the program. Are we addressing barriers to care effectively? Are we supporting them, giving them what they need to really engage fully in the program? So we're very excited about that and um, and only a little bit overwhelmed about the scaling up that we'll need to do. It's new positions, um, it's additional therapists, but um, but really, really happy about the opportunity to, to kind of not run a two-tier system for folks with chronic pain. The other challenge that we have is um, when folks leave the program and, and return to their primary care medical home. Um, so um, because they're not in the program anymore, they don't have access to the therapies that they may have found helpful. They may be able to pay for them. Some of the therapists that they'll use in the community have sliding scales, but also this return to, to a, a more traditional format in terms of interaction with um, the primary care medical home. And so we, we have felt strongly that we needed to um, to kind of address that. It's almost for us an ethical issue about um, kind of setting folks out into, into a world that will not necessarily reinforce the skills they've learned or provide access. So we're working with two pilot sites now um, to um, train folks in medical group visits so that you can imagine every Tuesday at the Colchester family practice here um, or a Tuesday a month, um, one of the clinicians will be working with a group of eight to 10 alumni, um, reinforcing skills. And then we're also working with Blue Cross Blue Shield to provide coverage for the therapies that people have found effective. So John Porter was in the program for 16 weeks. He really found acupuncture and Reiki to be incredibly helpful. So what does it look like then to devise an individualized policy for him that allows coverage for those um, kind of on an as needed basis? Because another nice part of the program is that that comprehensive nature lets people leave knowing what works for them or what has worked best. Um, and again, with, with creativity and willingness on Blue Cross Blue Shields, where we're working to design a program that would allow individualized cover, coverage for specific therapies. Um, I think we will also be working on creating other geographic um, coverage sites for the program or for some mirror of the program in other parts of Vermont. I think Blue Cross Blue Shield would like four or five of these. Um, and again, the intention here is twofold. It's to provide uh, care for folks with chronic pain. It's all to, also to support primary care clinicians um, as a resource um, for helping the folks they're working with gain some skills and gain some access to therapy, right? And then we do a lot of consultations here for folks that are in tough, tough uh, place with with their medicines or just with their pain. And finally, we're working on a transition service from the hospital. This would involve integrative services for acute pain in the hospital um, with a, a range of integrative therapies. Um, and, and for folks who go in for major surgery or major trauma and come out on opiates, transitioning them here um, at this office with integrative service and support and getting them off their opiates and then sending them back to primary care. And this idea of a pain doula, um, somebody who would follow people um, during their experience in the inpatient setting through to the outpatient setting with education and support. So, so these are the major um, kind of areas that we're looking forward uh, to working on. So I will I'll hold there. Um, maybe next slide, Sarah, is a thank you. I think it is a thank you as we head for the autumnal equinox. Um, so, so this is kind of a really quick run through the program. Um, again, I, I want to just reinforce this is, it's not like we figure out how to do it. We, we have learned a huge amount. We have a huge amount still to learn. So I'm not coming to you all saying, hey, look, this is the way to do it. I think each each system will want to develop its own kind of approach to, to chronic pain that's that has an integrative focus. Um, this is working for us right now, but we, we just still have a huge amount to learn. And we have um, 
we, you know, the program is almost unrecognizable from when we started four week, four years ago with eight weeks and two group sessions a week. And we were just almost running people into the ground with that. So we've learned and we've adapted um, and that process goes on. It's just what has to happen to, to kind of respond to what we're seeing as the needs of participants. Yes, so happy to talk more or, um, or answer questions about the program or get feedback. Thank you, John. Uh and tell you just it's it's just inspiring and the way you talk about the experience of pain and you keep the humanity and and you know we talk about a chronic pain issue but um clearly you were talking about human beings and reducing suffering and that that perspective is um i think so important and so healing in and of itself um and then adding to that in an effective program to move you know, the tools that we want uh to help people move through that um are, are you able yeah. to are you able to see the chat um um things are popping up and i'm yeah uh, so i can i can read the questions okay. also um marie had a few questions here maybe we'll just take one at a time uh, how much space do you have for the program what does the you know physical space look like yeah i think we the again to its credit um and i didn't dwell on this but the medical center really did put money into this we're on the second floor of one of the buildings on the medical campus Put a lot of money into making it look as unclinical as as it possibly could with the teaching kitchen a yoga space movement space um, i think our whole square footage is somewhere around 2000 square feet of course we would do it differently um, if we had it to design over again because we have three rooms that are kind of typical intake rooms with a table um, you know, exam table, we would change that so that it really was more a conversation back and forth because um, people with who are in chronic pain with the established diagnosis don't like to be put in more pain by getting up on a table. We would open up everything. We'd make our kitchen bigger. We'd make our um, our movement room bigger. Um, so so we have designs on more space down the road, but we're not pinched right now. We're actually in, in were luxurious by by standards of most of the rest of the network here. Um, and how many visits per week do patients participate in? Like how many hours? And yeah. uh, to that, I would say like group visits versus individual uh, treatments from yeah. various modalities. So each week, there's that uh, group session with their cohort, um, and that's again either ninety or one hundred twenty minutes, and then. Beyond that, people may be there another two or three days for therapies. Um, so sometimes they'll do therapies as well on the same day as their as their cohort meeting. Um, but this is part of the reality of of the program is that it is intensive, right? And so when folks are thinking about coming to the program um, and in the orientation and in the intake, even way before they start the program, you know this trying to educate folks about the fact that this this does take time and it's part of that lift that I discussed about you know when you when you go into the program it you it will be an intensive experience right um, and so that needs some space and so we encourage people um, to kind of arrange their work schedule if they're working or to look at FMLA um, just so they have some space to to engage um, in the deeper work of the program um it's a big ask yeah it, yeah it's an investment right yeah um do you feel comfortable sharing the dollar amount uh, of the bundled reimbursement form from the payer so i probably shouldn't but i but i will say this that um that it is about the cost of one and a half epidurals right okay. and so again this is the buying from the from the network's perspective if they want to generate funds um you know in a half day an anesthesiologist doing procedures can can generate what we generate from 16 weeks right and so this is another paradigm shift is is from that fee for service system how do you move to a value-based system which we're which we're working on and the network wants to do but the value in a program like this is paid off over time right that yeah. that theoretically if you can help people gain skills and, and gain framing of their experience and gain access to a few therapies 
that pays off over decades, right? So, so the other reality here is that um, the low cost really benefits the payers. It doesn't benefit the medical center, which still has to staff the emergency room and et cetera, et cetera, right? So the, the, the payoff here is really to the payers. And so how does that value get shared between the network and the, and the payer?